And that unexpected intro goes out to our dear friend Shea Belay, who I was, I was not expecting about that. that to be the intro. <laughs> but you know what? That's probably Shea sending us his infernal fuck yeah, bros. Send some gremlins over to uh, give us some technical difficulties. And I don't think it came from Shea. Shea wants us to succeed, and we want him to succeed because we love him. How you doing, Wade? Life is good. Well, Mercury I got my retrograde. cappuccino machine replaced, and it did not explode. Thank God. What would happen? How's that you? for low standards? <laughs> well, you know, I'm happy you got that because today, bro, we're, we're once again wrapping up season three of um, Magic TV. This time with none other than a very amazing author. Now, when you hear the word monstrous gnosis and human monstrosity, what comes to mind, especially in a magical perspective, what comes to mind? Oh my God! Well, the first thing that comes to mind right away is I think about the whole body of magic that's written around H.P. Lovecraft's fiction. fiction. Yeah, I mean. But, um, yeah, we haven't had uh, someone who could, in a long time, we have not had someone who could evoke those levels of just primal, mind-numbing horror. Mm -hmm. Well, could, you know what? You know, like you said, the, the oldest and um, strongest Emotion of mankind is fear, and the oldest and strongest kind of fear is fear of the unknown. Exactly. And it, it takes a very delicate touch to be able to play those particular keys on the piano. You know, I totally agree with you, brother, because we have one amazing fellow here. Um, I caught on to his wind through his publisher, Theon Publishing, when I first saw the book, The Benighted Path. Okay? And this in itself was a real shelf trophy because it's about primeval gnosis and the mo monster soul and i think this is a topic that not too many people focus on because i think this is more on the shadow unleashed if you get what i'm saying because a lot of shadow work wants to repress this unleashes it and if you like that aspect then the next book the infernal mass goes to the next level so without further ado we're honored today to have on on the show none other than the author of the infernal mask and the benighted path horror author, and practicing occultist, the ever-so-eloquent Mr. Richard Gavin. Hello, Richard. Welcome to the show. Hello, gentlemen. Good Thank morning. you very much for having me. Well, we're honored to have you right now, my friend. And, you know, we're just doing a bit, a bit of publication right now to let our friends get on the show. So how does it feel to be on Magic.TV? Oh, I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled. It's, it's great to be here. I'm glad we were able to set it up uh, for this season. Yeah, I mean, I've been kind of chasing you for quite some time. We finally got a, a decent enough of a schedule going. So let's just take one photo and share this to our friends on Instagram because a lot of our followers are on Instagram. But before we go any further, uh, tell us about you, Richard. How did your story begin? I mean, what got you into all of these practices? Well, you'd have to go back to early childhood. And I think this is a trait that's quite common for a lot of people who eventually become uh, practitioners of magic or interested in mysticism or, or art um, is that it seems to be innate to them. And for me, if I, if I were to trace it back, it's probably early childhood dreams and always having this sense that the world was a, a, an old place, um, that there was more to it than, than meets the eye. Now, why I had these impressions, I, I can't say. Um, perhaps it's, it's past life memory, um, but that was what really impelled me. And it was through the, these kinds of experiences of, of strange otherworldly dreams and things like that, that led me toward almost like a magnetism toward ghost stories, towards gothic horror, classic horror films, those kinds of things. Um, and as I grew older, that led to reading more about mysticism and the underpinnings that a lot of these stories drew from uh, for their subtext. Um, so that's really sort of how it began. It, it was uh, a deep interest in spirits, in the the whole notion of, of a, a haunted world of, of, an, of a nature that was ensouled. These are all things that kind of were innate to me. 
Um, and as I grew and developed and, and had more life experiences, they became more and more refined. But I think it was really that that nascency of, of having the kind of childhood that that was shaded with these kinds of impressions of the world. So since you said it started in childhood, who were some of your earliest inspirations for this? I mean, like, I'm sure you picked up a first book that kind of got you towards this direction. Do you recall some of the first earliest influences on you? I do, actually. I, I can remember vividly one of the um, external elements that was brought into my life at a really young age was my grandmother for Halloween one year gave me uh, an LP, gave me this album, and it was called Famous Ghost Stories. And it was basically an, an album with a really great readings of stories by Poe, by uh, Maupassant, by Charles Dickens, and had sound effects and things like that. And it was genuinely frightening, but I was absolutely fascinated with this record um, because it, as best as I can recall, it was one of the first times where I realized that, oh, other people sort of see the world the way I do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't think it was that coherent at the time. I was so young, but it was that that notion of, oh, this makes sense to me on some level, as frightening as it is, as uncanny as it is, as strange as these stories are, there is something going on underneath these stories that is that is very compelling. So even though it used to frighten me to, to listen to a lot of these ghost tales, there was also that attraction. So right away, it was already that kind of paradox, you know, almost like a hermetic paradox of, of you know, each thing having traces of its own opposite. And I was deeply drawn to that. And that, and that really touched off my interest in eventually pursuing a lot of works by these writers, primarily the supernatural writers of the 19th and early 20th century, mm -hmm. um, and led into studying the, the poetry of the romantics and things of that nature. So yeah, that was probably one of the early touchstones for me. Did you at an early age have any, because like there's this old saying that, that I read from Constantine, you see them, they see you. And the question is, did you have any early exposure to the spirit world? Like, did you ever see a ghost? Did you always feel attracted to them? Did he try to communicate with you or did it come later on in life? Uh, a little bit of both. I do mm -hmm. recall one of my earliest life memories is of seeing a, a, a feminine ghost. Mm -hmm. I was very young at the time. And for many years, I remember wondering if I had just dreamt this encounter. Um, but there was enough of my own real world history and my family history that it it was an authentic event, at least in the parameters of it. And I'm at, to this day convinced that it was absolutely a form of spiritual presence. And through that, that was also where I, as a child, I was fascinated with Ouija boards and with seances. And mm -hmm. these were these were the first sort of uh, practices that I had uh, that really allowed me to delve further into this. And the my view of it became more nuanced, obviously, as they always do when we mature. But that was that was really one of the touchstones for me was really understanding that we are not alone on this planet and that there are phases of life and death and that life and death interpenetrate one another, that it's not a clear cut distinction where one is an oblivion that has no bearing on the realm of the living and that the living do not have to concern themselves with the past or with the dead. Um, there's a vitality, although different types of vitality to both. Um, and so that was that was a really seminal moment where I was able to perceive that and see how there's a, a kind of permeation. There's an ambiance of the past, of of the dead, of memory, of history, historicity that has a great deal of impact on the way that we live our lives day to day. Um, it's just important that we learn some techniques to be able to pay attention to that, to perceive that, because it is, it is, it's subtle and complex. And of course, most of us through just the nature of our, our daily lives, we're so busy and so enthralled with the kind of day side activity, if you will, that it sometimes takes extreme measures of uh, pushing oneself to 
achieve that more refined state where you can appreciate those subtler aspects of the world. Digressing a bit from your personal history, because I do want to get back to that. Um, sure. I think a lot of people tend to underestimate the role that the spirit world plays in our everyday lives. And I wanted to ask you as an author and as an expert, is it something that you feel is neglected in modern society, whereas people aren't taking seriously the role that spirits actually can affect our lives? Or is it something that you feel is already kind of overinflated? How do you feel about that topic, sir? I feel it is to our detriment, it is grossly mm -hmm. neglected. Mm -hmm. um, I feel that there's this tendency amongst modern people to feel that you have to you have to choose. You're either going to be a, a rational, intelligent adult human being that ascribes to rigid logic, or you're going to be a, a sort of naive romantic fool who's going to believe anything. To, to sort of wander through life in this gullible form. Part of the reason I think we why- we learned that from the we, X-Files. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was just about to say that. He said we learned sorry, that from the X-Files. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Are you a molder or are you a scully? Right. You, know, you can't be both. <laughs> yeah, and that's and that's just it. It's, it's, it's a really kind of binary black and white paradigm that's, that's actually completely unnecessary. We, we impose that on ourselves. Um, and I think that for, for example, one of the reasons why I chose the, the term benighted for the, for the first book with Theon is because that term became a pejorative. It became an insult. It be, in its later usage, it, it basically implied someone who was uncultured, uncivilized, foolish, but its original term and I would encourage all of the viewers, if you are, are ever interested, to um, pursue etymology in the words that, and terminologies that you use. Tracing things back to their origins can be immensely important. And with benighted, it meant originally that it was nocturnal and overtaken by darkness. And when we look at this as a, as a term, that was employed here to see, can a reader, can can I as the author, take on this pejorative term? Can I can I take this term that was used as eventually to be an insult, and see how it may have merit? Can there can there be a way to almost alchemically transform that to see well what if we what if we are overtaken by this darkness? What if we allow that shadow aspect of self to eclipse the ego? You know, to, to allow that kind of solar identity-based mode of being to be almost forced into uh, being a witness to things that are it may seem irrational, that may seem uh, absurd or strange or frightening or other. And it's through that that we begin to cultivate a sensibility, a, a, a means of apprehending and interacting with this spiritual realm. So to get back to your original question, yes, I think it is something where we have, we feel that we've, we've needed to discard that. And that's to our detriment because it is really cutting off a major root of who we are as people, of, of the planet that we live on, uh, which is a living in sold place that we inhabit with all sorts of other life forms um, and I think that that is a way to enrich one's life is to begin to cultivate that sense of understanding the, the spiritual, the unseen, the, the mystery, that, that perennial mystery that permeates everything. Um, because without that, it, it can often just, one's life can just degenerate mm -hmm. into ego gratification, you know, paltry, paltry needs kind of going based on whim, based on pleasure principle, and there's no depth to it. You know, you skim the surface of your life and then suddenly, you know, you turn around and look and realize that these decades have passed and you've not actually really bothered to have any introspection, have any understanding of anything other than that, that chattering ego that is always trying to steer the ship 
and control you know what we allow in what we what we allow ourselves to uh, practice to do so it really becomes a um a kind of dictator which is not at all necessary um it can be used you know in in the correct measures of course logic the, the you know the ability to rationalize our intellects they're they're an important part of our life they're an absolutely uh, vital aspect but it is just an aspect it is not the entirety and that's where my writing comes in as a as a at least hopefully as a means to inspire other modes of thinking other ways of being it's funny that you mentioned that because um the energy that i'm picking up from your book especially your books there is a very dark energy to it, and I love how it romanticizes the human darkness. But one thing people have not done is dis di differentiate between the words dark and evil. They are not yes. the same. They are not Absolutely. at all the same. People think, oh, it's dark. It must be bad. No. Example, if my wife leaves me for another man, I'm in a dark place. It doesn't make me evil. Okay. The thing about it is when these dark things happen, a lot of energy is released transformational energy good example yes. would be vincent van gogh a lot of darkness happened to him he did a lot of beautiful things however the problem is people are too afraid to delve into that and they've got these moniker of ways of trying to deal with it in a very loose perspective does your book offer means of authentically using the power of darkness not evil again darkness the human darkness to use it as kind of like a servant to the greaterness of your own spiritual and internal development. I certainly hope that it does. And that was mm -hmm. definitely, um, in, a, in a broad term, that was definitely uh, part of my intention. I think you've really hit on something important, which is that because many people conflate, you know, evil or, or destructiveness or uh, cruelty, these kinds of things with their, their darkness or the, the unconscious, however you want to phrase it, um, there is that trepidation because they think if they explore that, it's going to knock the lid off this Pandora's box and horror and violence and, and mayhem is going to ensue. Mm -hmm. But again, you know, when, when we look at it from a, a more, in, I guess for lack of a better term, enlightened perspective, you really begin to see that Dark and light are there. There are differences in the way that a grotto is different from a mountain peak. You know, one is not good and the other is not evil. They're just very. They provide different perspectives. They're very different experiences. Um, but a human being is perfectly capable of experiencing both. And I think one of the reasons why the the imagery that permeates a lot of my work is dark and and. Uh, has that that otherness that imbues it is because the human condition has become almost ironclad in its certainties about uh, what is truth what is what is correct in terms of modes of behavior what is what it means to be civilized and sophisticated and to maintain this kind of uh, you know progressive linear mode of constant self-improvement well it's so rigid that the things that lie outside of that are now in a shadow world. They've, they've been cast off, which does not mean that they have been, you know, destroyed or, or removed from the human condition. Um, and they've been they repressed. Were, yes, exactly. Exactly. So allowing them voice, one begins to see that the things that do have that element of fear, to your point about going into you know a dark place due to trauma well we cannot live our lives without us without some forms of trauma you know mm -hmm. obviously we're not going to consciously cultivate that or seek that out but these kinds of initiatory endeavors allow us to have a pool of resources from which we can draw when these other traumas occur also it enables us to really draw from that and grow fear is often seen as something that oh this is you know frightening or dark well that's often because you're now when that fear begins to set in often it's because you are on the cusp of transformation you know change is a bit authentic deep change is about to 
occur or you were on the threshold of that. So I think, sorry, go ahead. No, no, please go ahead. I just wanted to ask somebody, by all means, I want to hear what you have to say. Yeah, so I was just going to basically say that rather than seeking out um, darker forms of magic or darker aesthetics for the sake of fear for its own sake, um, think of it instead as ways to find those uh, way marks mm -hmm. that evoke those deeper emotions and then take that further. So it's less about just trying to get th thrills and chills and, and having you know your life resemble a horror film or something like that. It's more about using that and getting to the depth of what these things may mean, where they may lead to, um, what they signify. Because I, at this point, Mr. Gavin, I don't want to like come off as somebody who's wrongly classifying your book, but I've actually taken a personal interest in the study of shadow work. Okay, that's a term you're hearing a lot nowadays, and a lot of the white lighters out there, oh, shadow work, shadow work, shadow work. But right. for ninety percent of the stuff I've read, couldn't even hold a candle to what I've read here in the benighted path. Do you know why? The other aspects of shadow work I've read outside of your book has all about forgiving. And, you know, treating your shadow or even the, your benighted self as a problem. This one actually unleashes. It celebrates. It said, hey, this is you. This isn't going anywhere. It's Peter Pan's shadow. You know what I mean? You got to work with it. It's not going anywhere. And this is what I loved about your book because it shows to the world a common human condition. But it doesn't show it as, a, as an aspect of this is something that needs to be solved. In other words, this is something you need to learn to work with and let it work for you. But there is something I wanted to ask. I've noticed with a lot of people who do tend to dive into the more benighted side of things, sometimes they lose themselves to it. Like Absolutely. I've, I've coined it shadow possession. I don't know what you call it. Is there that danger? And if there is, based on your studies, how can you prevent it from happening? That's an excellent question. And first, I really, I appreciate your, your compliments on the work. It's that's, that's really heartening. You're picking up what I was putting into the work. Uh, and that's, that's fantastic. And I think your perception of the work is absolutely correct. It, it is about that integration. Uh, because this is part of the human condition, without question. And, and not only is it just you sort of begrudgingly, okay, I'll face these things. No, this is one of the this is one of the primal aspects that enables one to fully inhabit the world. Um, and in terms of sorry, what could you just quickly repose your question? I sort of lost shadow of possession thought. because when you dive yes. into this Thank practice, you. you could lose yourself. You could really lose absolutely. Yourself. That is, a, that is a, a, a very real case. I think this is also something that is symptomatic of any spiritual pursuit in general. Um, there is always that risk. And this is why I think it's really important that with my work, I, I would never advise anyone to completely disregard their, their, their logical mind, their, their sort of day, day side life, if you will because it's an integral part of one's life and it provides that balance. Um, the main thing with my own work coming from the position that I do is that I feel that this sort of day side, solar logic driven uh, mode of being has become so inflated and so imbalanced that the darker aspects, the night side aspects of one's life are so rare that we were almost out of touch with them. So delving headlong into it, like I do with, with the work that I, I produce, is a means to really um, just explore that fully, to allow that to flourish. Um, because it, it would, will take time to break down those personal um, prejudices, their barriers, your own taboos. This is something that only an individual can do. I would never advise anyone on specific actions that they need to take or not take. But in principle, it's, it's essentially that. However, to your point, yes, there is absolutely a very real risk. We're talking about if any sort of spiritual path has any authenticity, there is always a risk. Magic, initiation, uh, any sort of mystical practice, it is by its nature destabilizing, right? I think any anyone that has had any degree of experience with that would, would probably agree that 
it's it is there when when it is introduced into one's life it usually completely upsets the apple cart uh, that is its that's its nature that is its role because it is trying to get you to uh release yourself from your own stayed and and contained vision of what self is and what world is and and begin exploring it more fully so with that yes you always have to make sure I often say it's it's almost like you, you, you swim into those depths and then you swim back for a time. And then you maybe swim a little bit further and, and, and go out a little bit deeper and then come back for a time. So it's again, going out and then the reintegration and again. And this can happen on, you know, it can happen on a moment by moment basis, frankly, provided that you always give it context. I think one of the things that I'm sure both you gentlemen have seen this over the years, just maybe with people that you know, or, you know, know of, where someone's interest in the esoteric becomes so all consuming that they they almost get lost in this fantasy world. And, and they really can no longer um, deal with anything. Everything becomes part of their magic. Their magic is going to take care of any problem in their life, any any worldly uh, endeavor that they want to have, it really becomes this this crutch, uh, and that's that's a real risk that has to happen uh, that that doesn't have to happen, provided that one is aware of the uses of their initiatory path, what it is that they're aiming for out of their initiatory path, and understanding that you know when we undertake these kinds of authentic uh, spiritual endeavors it's not always going to comply with what you want. In fact, it rarely ever will comply with what it is that you want. Uh, it may give you what you need, but that may not be what you're looking for at that point in your life. So it is a very destabilizing force. Um, and that's why it's, it is critical to always maintain an, an anchor in, in the everyday world. Um, I, because I think it just, that also not, not only does that prevent you from you know, falling into delusion and, and mental illness and your life going into complete chaos, it also is what allows you to continue your initiatory path. You know, if you are able to integrate, to go to go back and forth, to be able to work through, to find inspiration in these things and continue on, then you will continue to become uh, further and further. You will be, you will realize yourself more and more fully. So I think it, it has all the benefits in the world of really being able to maintain that balance because no, of course, that, that sort of risk of, of possession, of being lost, of, of falling prey to, you know, your own neuroses, your own delusions, whatever they happen to be, is, is absolutely not what, what I, would, I would want to see any of my, my readers or anyone undergo. Wade, you know, it looks like you have something you want to ask. Go ahead. In the 90s, when, uh, when I... Uh, made my crossing for the first time. They had, I, I was realizing that the, if you think about the, the physical properties of daytime, uh, when the, the sun is up, the light is all around you, you're blinded by this giant ball of light in the sky. That's very much like when you get knowledge and conversation of your holy guardian angel. There's this one source of light dominates your entire life it lights everything up. You can work. You can do all of the things. Um, you All your activity is in the daytime. But then at night, most people just go inside and hide and wait for the day. But at night is when you can see that your sun is really just one of the billions of stars that's all around you. It's what Crowley called the night of Pan. When you realize that, yes, I'm here. And all of these other lights are also here. And you can really see beyond your own sphere of influence, uh, which is why there's a difference between the Order of the Golden Dawn and the Order of the Silver Star. You know, come get me, Mathers. But the <laughs> what I've noticed is that if you had, if you've ever grown a garden, you notice during the day, flowers open up, they suck up the sunlight, they do all the, you know, putting out roots and everything. But all the growth happens at night. That's right. And it's the same thing with people. You, you you go about your activities, you gather your strength, you do all the things in the light, and you do all your growing in the dark. Which Absolutely. I, I, I always make a difference between darkness and nighttime because nighttime isn't dark. 
it's just greater visibility for all the things that are around, all the other sources of light that are around you. Absolutely, and, yeah. I, this I, I, very I, much sure. ties in with that, with with the um, with respect to the word benighted itself. Yes, definitely, definitely it does. You know, and you and you reminded me as well. There's a there's a great uh, line that that Carl Jung had, where he he talked about another common misconception that people have, where they equate psyche with consciousness, and the the model that he used for it is he said consciousness is the torch that you're using to light your way as you wander through an immense dark cave psyche is the entire cave psyche is the whole thing it is it's the light of consciousness as well as this enveloping darkness that is you know filled with with potentia that is filled with other forms as well as you know as you were saying there it's it's it is that form of of growth, indeed. It's going to bring me to the next segment I wanted to discuss with you. Um, just just a little bit of a segue back to your own personal history. You were sharing that you were very very much into this whole the horror, the ghost stuff. But what made you take the leap that most horror or supernatural enthusiasts don't take, which is the leap into the actual practice of magic and occultism, because you could have gone either the Neil Gaiman route and just stayed a rock re reader and writer, or you can go gone the Al Al Alan Moore route and just dived into it head neck deep and now is the walking talking wizard. And obviously we went knows which one you chose. So what made you take that leap into actual occultism? Uh, well, what was your what was the the pull? What was the decision? You would you mind sharing about that? Yeah, no, not at all. And that's a great question. Because uh, I think it's very true. I think one of the main differences um, was that I always sensed, rightly or wrongly, but I always sensed that the, the finer, the, the best examples of, of supernatural fiction, you know, the best ghost stories, the best gothic novels, the best of, of these types of films and, and novels were pointing at aspects of life that were very much real. Now, that's not to suggest that the narratives were real or that they're all true stories. You know, it's, it's, it's nothing that blunt, but really it was conveying impressions of the world that were, you know, based not just on folklore and myth, but on a, a, a kind of visceral experience. Now, the particularities of these forms, be it the vampire or the werewolf, these may be, or ghost, these may be just metaphors for something that was basically implying the fact that we inhabit an ensouled world that is teeming with presences of all sorts that we will never be free of of the past nor should we be that you know nature is is here as a, a living force that was not designed for us so there is a certain degree of risk and danger in nature but also a great deal of beauty so these were always things that were in the back of my mind and it's it was always a natural inclination that literature was only one avenue to experience this and the way that i viewed it was i was going to try and take as many avenues as i could to have as inroads to this this sense of the perennial mystery of being um you know and that includes love that includes literature that included um as i was mentioning seances and things of that nature strangely enough it, it wasn't until i was probably in my late teens, early 20s, where the idea of any sort of um, ceremonial magic or, or that form of ritual magic even occurred to me, which is bizarre, I know, but it, it, I, I guess f even though I had read some of the literature, for whatever reason, I was never able to um, connect that to my own interests. I think a part of it is that my initial perception of magic was that it was it was often geared towards attaining very specific goals you know uh having a very specific want that you could enhance the likelihood of attaining through this ritual and there's no moral judgment on that it was just for me i was more interested in having that door to this other place open up um and later you know my my experiences with uh magic and ritual in general led to practices that were uh, almost peripheral to it scrying for instance you know mm -hmm. using utilizing trance states these are things that really spoke to me um, and that i was able to develop so that was really the the impetus for why i i went from simply writing about these things 
to uh, practicing as well. Because as I said, I, I viewed literature as an excellent way to inspire and give a kind of dramatic context to these principles. But I knew that the principles themselves were independent of the art form. They weren't, I, I never viewed them as products of just the human imagination to give people something to, to entertain them um, for, for an evening. It was really pointing to authentic impressions of, of the world that is not just the humanistic conception of the world, but more of the world entire, including this, this subtle um, supernatural, for lack of a better term, but the spiritual, the spiritual plane that I always felt was just outside of the apparent, that was just there. Um, and so I was looking for all, any, any means I could find to, to penetrate that realm, to experience that realm and engage in a dialogue with it. Well, this is pretty, you know, that was amazing. And um, for those of you who are also interested, we have Richard Gavin on the, on the show right now. And if you ask me, this is probably the best talk I've had on true shadow work in a long time. All right. So thank oh, you thank very you. much, Andrew, for this. Because um, we're going to go to the next segment, which we basically is what we call the current event segment with Richard. But I do want to ask something particular because. Um, as we were saying earlier, your book helps not just understand the benighted nature, which I think is the true unleashed shadow or repressed nature of the human psyche, but it even teaches you to celebrate it, which a lot of talks nowadays with the term shadow work being very popular, it's getting a lot of like, it's getting a lot of, how do I say, popularity from the wrong people. The way I've seen it is like this. The way most people talk about the word shadow work is if you have a nuclear arsenal, they're telling you to disarm it. The way you're share, sharing with us is, hey, you got a nuclear arsenal. One, you could use it as a nuclear deterrent or two, you could use it for nuclear energy and fuel your nation. So there's a very constructive way of looking at it. So with that being said, how does the public perception of the true benighted nature how do you see it going in the next couple of years, especially with all the negative publicity going around about it? And people just don't got the idea the way you did in the book, The Benighted Path. Do you see it getting better? Do you see it getting worse? Do you see more authors realizing that there's a benighted side of things, not just this shadow side of things? What's your take on that? That's a great question. You know, I, I hopefully I would love to see because I think that anything that has a kind of superficiality to it mm -hmm. will eventually fizzle out. And I understand that, you know, right now there is a lot of interest in, in magic in general and in uh, whether it's it's forms of witchcraft or quote unquote witchcraft that we, you know, we see through social media. These kinds of things will, I think, eventually peter out. I think generally speaking, there will always there's always going to be a core and it may be a small minority, but they are always going to be yearning for something more authentic. Mm -hmm. And I think that with these very rigid, almost puritanical moral judgments on how we should be perfect and, and how we should be, you know, without any quote unquote flaws. Well, again, from a, from a, a, a sort of hermetic perspective, I suppose these, these flaws or supposed flaws um, are integral qualities of one's existence. You know, it's like there's there's a great line in um, a passage in one of Ludwig Klages's works where he's describing, uh, he sort of challenges the idea of the, the ideal romantic partner, you know, your ideal soulmate. And he said the sort, of, the sort of platonic ideal is that this person just embodies these universal qualities and it doesn't really, you know, you can ignore their flaws because they have these other aspects of them that are eternal. And there might be some truth to that, but Clogus's challenge to that is if you were to have two identical, you know, spouses that were your spouse, you would know which one was authentically yours because all of these supposed quirks and shortcomings, that is what makes that person that person. Um, you know, and, and a little earlier we were talking about the constellation of stars, and I think that's one of the great things, um, one of the in my opinion, one of the finest things that Crowley ever wrote was just that that very simple notion of every man and woman is a star. There is absolutely the company of stars. yes, right? And they have they have their own trajectory. They have their own path. There's no, you know, this this idea of 
of needing to sway other people to your own mode of thinking is nonsensical. You know, it, not only is it detrimental, it's it's completely nonsensical. But with well, that- they're following you around, they're not stars, they're planets. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. So it's a, it's a nice simple model that I think is really applicable because, you know, one of the things that is the most basic um, and it's really one of the simple kind of life philosophy lines that that I pulled from Oscar Wilde when I was very young from the picture of Dorian Gray, which is that the aim of one's life is to realize oneself fully. And I believe that that, that involves th this kind of uh, exploration of, of, of these supposedly darker aspects, because again, they often seem negative only in the context of a modern mindset, which is extremely secular, which is extremely mechanistic, which is often hyper capitalistic, which is often, you know, very paranoid um, about how you're going to appear to others, um, how this, you know, how this may look, how this may damage your, your social media reputation or whatever it happens to be. Um, and that's a real neurotic fear, which is never a healthy place to act from. Um, well, especially and, these days, we have so much going on. Mm -hmm. The human race is going through a very dark time, mm -hmm. and that seems to be manifesting as narcissism and authoritarianism. Absolutely. And conformity. This is and something conformity. you, you Don't can't conformity. get the genie back into this particular bottle. We have to work through it. I mean, especially in light of American politics and recent presidents and people who are finally learning how to be their worst selves. Right. And just accepting that as part of themselves, but they're not incorporating it into a functional whole yet. Mm -hmm. Hopefully soon, but not yet. Which brings me to my next people question. That are, that are just acting out all their worst impulses and they're finding the freedom to do that. And eventually it's got to be like when little kids learn that they can draw on the walls. Eventually they have to figure out like, look, there's a time and place for this. You can do it. You have to do it on the walls that need drawn on. You have to draw the things that need, you don't just walk around drawing a butt on a wall in school because you figured out that you can. We have to mature to the point that we can actually make use of this power that we've discovered in ourselves. This brings me to my next question. I wanted to ask Mr. Gavin about this. Uh, and in plain and simple English, because we will use this for the, um, for the, 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 the real, what are the benefits of the truly actualized benighted soul when you finally have come to accept and unleash that benighted soul that benighted version of you you're not in repression of it anymore and it's not controlling you it's an inter integrated part of yourself what are the benefits of the benighted soul the main benefit that comes from this is the absolute freedom that comes with letting go and understanding that a lot of these things that we feel we've got this ironclad grip on that make us ourselves and if we if we if our grip loosens even slightly everything is going to fall into chaos is simply untrue it allows one to be able to listen and perceive more deeply it allows one to understand that they are part of a deeper world that this planet is not simply a collection of resources for our that we can call for our own amusement, but that it is a, a delicate web uh, that that is interdependent. Um, it allows us to understand the both the you know the beauty and the horrific and the horror and the beautiful. It allows one to really understand and be completely fulfilled by paradox. You know, I believe that this is this is a, a crucial part of existence in general, initiatory existence in particular, is the, the concept that terror and the sublime are inextricably linked. They, and, and there is beauty in one and there is horror in the other and that they they feed into one another. So by having that one's life becomes dynamic one's life becomes inspiring. Um, it's no longer a, a mad chase for something external 
that you know is a, is a goal that they're after or some material possession or some form of social status you know those things can be they can still be an aspect of your life but you will be functioning on a on a i think a a deeper and darker in the sense of again like a cave like like the the, the sort of quiet solitude that comes um where you feel centered once again you will be functioning from that that deeper aspect of self you will be acting from the depth as opposed to a, a quick reflex or a a neurotic sphere of not wanting to look foolish or to say the wrong things um it's it's a matter of listening and acting and engaging with otherness with darkness having that dialogue of a constant reciprocal back and forth dialogue one and it's may authentic, ask, right exactly and one may ask why why would one do that well because it is by engaging with that that we come back and either produce art or we are inspired to you know a, a, a grove near our home suddenly becomes sacred becomes like a chapel you know, because we've had these these numinous in encounters there. And the other key point that I would say with this is, is this in objective or is this just a subjective experience? It's, I believe, at a seam where those two, the external and the internal, overlap. So it does not, it, the, the specifics of whether this impression was purely subjective when one is, let's say, in a, in a wooded grove and they have this sense of, of the eternal, they have a sense of it being a sacred place. The fact is, it has inspired you to achieve that state, this rare and inspiring state. So being bogged down in the specifics is completely anathema. Again, it's just a matter of, and this is something I really try to emphasize in my books, is following those subtle threads. They will be subtle. They will be very easy to dissect and refute by the by the intellect, because we are so unaccustomed to having experiences of the sacred. Our, our lives are the modern world is really not structured for us to factor that in any longer. So we have to really press through and also accept the fact that these these subtle and often fleeting initial glimpses can be cultivated they can be the seeds that you plant and tend and they will hatch and then eventually you're going to have this garden within yourself of a, a sense of the eternal of a sense of this more ensouled reality and i think that would be the main benefit we have a question on the chat lines from one of my students robin ting how do you ensure your ego is not at play in doing shadow work is the goal to transform to transform your shadow to a more acceptable behavior or trait i'd love to hear your take on that mr Gabbard. that's yeah that's a great question i think you know the ego is is a really it can be a very insidious force in in any sort of endeavor i think one of the ways that you can always try to keep it in check in this type of work is essentially doing things and that would almost be shocking to oneself that does you know i'm not i'm not necessarily saying anything that is that is horrific or, or, or criminal or violent but just for instance if there is a a patch of of woods or a trail or perhaps some really remote area that has that sense of of foreboding and is eerie that's where you would go to work that's where you would go and and you know invoke and or meditate or do some you know or, or lay an offering and the reason for that is because the, the ego will grate against that the you know the ego is going to your sense of self is always going to try to understand the whys of what you're doing you know the the, the well what's the purpose of this well the purpose will be revealed later that is that's a very simple piece of advice that i would offer to to the student that just asked this question the the whys or the meanings of these acts of of you know why we we use this particular sigil or this particular uh statue or why we go to this grove and lay these offerings out that will be revealed in time and the ego is for that point is simply going to have to accept that it is not going to understand 
why this is being done. And through doing that, this deeper sense, this deeper self will be allowed to flourish, to speak more. Because very often what you'll discover is the things that are under the surface of the conscious mind, I, do, I simply don't agree with that kind of Freudian model that it's this morass of ugly, you know, violent, degenerate thoughts. It is a, often where you will find your ability to interact with other spirits, sometimes through dreams, sometimes through ritual. Um, it, is, it, is the, it is the tether that binds you to that, that deeper netherworld, to that inhabited spiritual uh, underlaying of, of the planet. So I would say that doing those things for the, without understanding their necessary purpose, if, if it feels right, on a gut instinct level that this feels the proper method to begin this particular form of your own practice, go with that, go with that. And then eventually the deeper meaning will reveal itself to you. So I hope I that answers. It was uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau who defined the um, conditions of the sublime being uh, the qualities of the sublime being vastness, obscurity, and power. And these yes. are all things that we, that we, it's a bottomless ocean that you can't really you can't really plumb the depths of but you can bring back infinite benefits from it so by dipping into that on a regular basis it's not as if you're taming the shadow it's you're allowing the shadow to empower your ego yes you're you're, Absolutely. you're bringing Perfect. back fish from the depths to to feed you to fuel you mm -hmm. but yeah, it, do definitely. it doesn't seem to work the other way around you're never going to tame the shadow Absolutely not. And, you know, and this is this is the thing is that it, it's really it's a fool's errand to to begin attempting that, because, again, this this I think that that aspect and this goes back to something you said earlier, Robert, with this notion of of kind of having this really superficial um, vision of of the shadow. Is that to even begin to think that this needs to be perfected or overcome or whipped into submission is itself most likely an expression of the ego you know what what people fear within themselves is is often needlessly um shunned by silencing oneself and and listening and allowing this this more receptive mode of being which is a key point to this more nocturnal work is receptivity um you will see that these were latent aspects that sometimes were struggling to to be seen, to be manifest. You know, there's that line from from Nietzsche, from Beyond Good and Evil, of all great things must first wear dark and terrifying masks in order to inscribe themselves on the hearts of humanity. It's very true. You know, the, the, it may be this this vastness. It it is this numinous sense. And again, the idea of of uh, controlling it, of perfecting it, of solving it is is much like the fact of the way people believe that they are going to solve the perennial mystery that informs all initiatory paths. Solving it is not even the point. I think it's the active dynamic engagement with it. That it's is... even more ludicrous to think that you could purge yourself of it. I've heard a lot of people say, oh, I have to purge this. Like I've had people tell me, and I catch them with this. It's like, oh, I have to purge anger from my life. It's low vibration. And I say, why do you say that? Because it's not spiritual to be angry. And I'm like, what's your religion? Oh, I'm Christian. You know that Jesus went ape shit when they turned his temple into a market? And if he can right. do it, <laughs> you know what I mean? It has Jesus. So come on. Anger is just as human as love. And you have to not learn to purge it because purging it's not going to get anywhere. You have to learn to accept that it's part of who you are. It's that yes. accept it gives you control over it. And I well, think it's as well the difference with... between Edison and Tesla when one of them thought, well, we should have all this electricity should be in nice, neat little containers and carried by wires. And, you know, Tesla is like, no, there is electricity all around us. And all we have to do is dip our hands in and pull some out. And so if you if you look at them from those particular points of view, yeah, you're like, yes, OK, it's it's very powerful. It can easily, you know, fry you like an elephant, but it can also, you know, power all of your, well, everything, even, you know, the devices that we're working on right now mm -hmm. to communicate. It, it yes. really depends on how you use it. And 
there's no way to abs absolutely contain it where it won't just die on you. And I think as, as well, you know, with, with that, I think a lot of those initial fears that people have about um, any sort of exploration of, of this, of the more unconscious aspects of, of existence is they almost default to these extreme negative damaging examples, right? I can't do that because then I'll be, if I embrace anger or I, I if I don't purge this, then I'm going to be enraged all the time and I'm just going to be impossible to deal with. If I allow this to, you know, if I don't stay in control of this, then I, I could become, you know, out of control with by allowing this to manifest. The one of the key points is we're never in control. We're we're never in control. Our bodies function automatically. The idea that we are always in control of these things at all times is ludicrous because so much to the to the point that was made earlier about you know seeds growing in the dark. So much of our existence is unconscious. It is out of the reach of the conscious self. Now it can eventually maybe access parts of it. That's that's absolutely true. But at any given moment of the day, we're not even aware of a lot of the 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 impressions, the thoughts, the um, moments of inspiration, the you know memories that are tr being trawled up for no reason. This is all going on beneath the surface. Um, and that is that is absolutely as it should be, and that is way of, I, I believe, all existence. The majority of it is occurring beneath the surface, in the dark, under uh, out out of the uh, out of view of the apparent, or behind the apparent, or within the apparent. And so, these types of practices are what allows one to engage with and 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 tease out these aspects, these deeper aspects. Um, and that's, that's to me, a, again, a more fulsome experience of the world. It's not even about dark or light. I think a lot of these images and things like that seem other and seem so dark to us because we are so divorced from this uh, in vision of an ensouled world. You know, I really believe that the, the concept of, you know, the spirits of the dead, for instance, are, frightening to a lot of people because we we need to believe that death is a finality death is you know is the end of physical life and that is it everything ceases about that person and i think that the just the very notion that there can be any sort of you know perhaps not immortality but any sort of longevity perhaps reincarnation to this 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 distresses certain people and i think that that is what plays a large part in why they seem so shocking to us in this kind of modern um, and and very sort of materialist rationalist perspective. Wow, that that's amazing! And you know what? I'm really I'm, I don't even want to preempt it, but I really hope that this discussion goes further in the third book that you're writing because I mean, just what we've learned alone from this the first book. And for those who want to go deeper into the, 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 the trench in the second book, because it's a deep dive. I'm just telling you guys, I mean, like, have a lot of coffee and a lot of writing material because the Infernal Mask is not for the weak will. I'm just so thankful to have learned this from you because, like I said, there's a lot of posers out there who don't know the time of day of the shadow. And I don't even think it's right to call what you teach the shadow. It truly is the benighted. So to that, I really, really thank you from the bottom of my heart because right now is my favorite segment of the show, Occult X. And now right. Richard Gavin is going to teach us something. I really hope it's not the cookies we were talking about. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm going to give you the floor right now, Rich. Um, we'd love to hear what you have to offer because, you know, this episode is all yours. All right. So what are we learning from you today? I would say that one of the most important things is just going to be a, a simple uh, exercise. And it's something that I, I've alluded to a little bit earlier. For anyone that is interested in any of the things that we've been discussing today, it is important to find those places that are outside of civilization where you can experience true solitude and to go there at night. And if it is eerie, if it is a place that is uh, has a sense of uh, fright, f fearfulness for you, to go further. 
And that would be the main thing that I would say to everyone is that when you are achieved in that, to listen, to also not be afraid to invoke, to ask, you know, the spirits of that place to speak to you in some way. Now, now this may not happen right away. It may not lead to an apparition. It could be an, a moment of intuition that you have, perhaps a dream later that night. But engage in that dialogue and follow it through on its terms. If there's one thing that I would advise anyone that is interested in any form of mystical endeavor, it is to not view it as simply another or slightly more exotic way of attaining what you want materially. You know, view this as a genuinely transformative experience, something that in this sense is almost combative to your ego. And from there, I think you will, I would hope that one would then see that there is this spiritual, uh, ambiance to the world that is still intimately and intimately accessible. It is not something that is a, a relic of the past. It's not something that only the ancients were able to do. Um, these ancient cultures were far more attuned to it because they lived so much closer to the natural world and had a sense of the spirit realm and of magic more deeply than we do today. But that being said, it is still right at, at one's fingertips. You know, it really does not require a great deal of uh, elaborate trappings or, or elaborate ritual. It's really just allowing yourself to, to be receptive, to be still, to listen, and to accept the communications, the manifestations, that dialogue on its terms rather than how you wish it to be. And that would be it. I hope that's satisfactory, but I, that's, that's- I, I have one question just to go. Sure. Would you recommend people go in a natural state or would you recommend if people are into psychedelics to use it or alcohol, mind altering substances, or is this something you'd say, no, be in your normal state and receive? What's your take on it? I would say normal state. You know, I'm not going to be overly moralistic about the use of, of you know, psychedelics and so forth. Different people have, you know, been able to utilize these tools for millennia. Um, but I would say the, the best way to do it is to really just, um, if you were looking for something to sort of add a sensitizing force, utilize fear. Go to those places that are, are, you know, not necessarily the physical threat where it's going to be, you know, you may suffer bodily harm. But if it if it is an eerie, unsettling place, go with that. Follow Can that. Can this also work in an urban setting? Like if there's a haunted house and, you know, it, you really feel afraid of that, can you go there? Does no, it have to be natural? It, it could, but I would say that from my own from my own take on it, my own experience, I think it, it's, it is absolutely imminently accessible in in the wilderness um and the reason for that the reason why i say that is is not because a, a haunted house for instance wouldn't evoke those feelings because i'm sure that they would but when one gets into the wilderness it's they're automatically in an environment that is that destroys concepts of your own controlled environment you are now you've lost that control to a large degree because you're in the wild and that is going to require a sensitivity. And if you're in the wild at night, as anyone who's been in, in true darkness, when you're out in the wilderness where there is no light pollution whatsoever, um, it is it is truly a, a, an experience that seems almost like another planet. It's, it's incredibly potent and evocative. And I think beginning that way is what will really allow one to access this world that is not humanistic that is not human centric you know we play a part in it but it involves other forms of of both spiritual beings it involves animal life it involves the plant life so it it really does enable one to engage with that that broader world that has none of the um comforts and the trappings and the crutches that we've come to uh, experience in urban environments 
you know, something that I used to enjoy um, when I was in the Navy. Um, I would, if we were at sea, and if there was no moon, after, at night after I would work out, I would go up topside. And Navy ships run with the lights off. So I would find a spot up on the main deck, sometimes right out in front, sometimes all the way up in the signal bridge. And it's absolute darkness. 100% complete. And you, you, you literally can't see your hand in front of your face. And it might take 10, 15 minutes for your eyes to adjust to starlight. But after a while, all you can see through the entire sky is stars everywhere. You can oh, see the Milky incredible. Way. You can see galaxies. It's gorgeous. And I understand that not everybody has access to a Navy ship in the middle of the... But you can go out in the desert, any place that's completely empty, and just have that, that experience of the sublime of the vastness absolutely. and the power and obscurity. And it's just, it's absolutely amazing. That's, since that's I, a great What point. I noticed is that since I got, since I just left the gym, when I'm standing out there in the air, I'm steaming. The steam is oh, rolling wow. off my body and you can see it in the starlight. It's just, it's amazing. I recommend that's everybody incredible. do it at least once. It's really something. What a great story. And you've also hit on something, I think that is another really critical point, which is it is absolutely not necessary to um, make these excursions needing to go to a very specific exotic place where you have to, you know, save up thousands of dollars and travel to somewhere that's been uh, a noted spiritual place. Anywhere on the planet, you will be able to find some place of, uh, of the wild space that does speak to you on that level. And you can begin there. You know that that's one thing I always advise. It's not necessary to to travel to the pyramids of Giza or to you know to ancient to ruins in Greece, for instance. You can find these places anywhere on the planet, especially the stuff that's not man-made. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that's key. Very much. Thank you for your work. This is something yes. that that we need. Yeah. Before oh, we forget, so um, once again, uh, Richard is the author of these two amazing books by Theon Publishing. The Benighted Path and the Infernal Mask. Do you have anything you want to plug? Upcoming workshops, seminars, books that you'd like to share with the public? Well, at the moment, I'm just uh, in the midst of working on another collection of supernatural fiction. So that'll be the next book. And then after that, I'll probably be returning to do some more of uh, work on the esoteric books. So All right. And do you have a website stuff. that people can, can, can visit you at? Yep. Yeah, it's uh, richardgavin.net. And I'm also on Facebook if anyone wants to send a friend request them there as well. Can we order these add... books off your site? Yes, there are all the all the books are linked on my website as well. Yeah, they're by Theon Publishing. Very beautiful books and very well taken care of. I mean, very well presented. Um, like I said, this is two, but I was already sensing after the second one, the third one is coming, hopefully before my 50th birthday. So once again, Richard, it's been such an honor to have you on the show. Thank you for helping us towards the tail end of season three. And that being said, don't go anywhere. We're going to put you in the guest room and give you our firm formal thanks afterwards. Wade, you and I got a special guest to wrap up season three. We're going to announce him now. Good night, Richard. Have a wonderful day. Been a pleasure, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you.